Master of Orion 2 Battle at Antares is a sci-fi, turn-based strategy game by Simtech Software and published by Microprose. It was released in 1996 and is the sequel to the 1993 title Master of Orion. Like its predecessor, your objective is to conquer the galaxy. There are 13 races you can choose from, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. You can also create a custom race, which you can define using a number of picks to modify productivity, combat effectiveness, the type of government, homeworld bonuses, and special abilities. Giving your race certain weaknesses in some areas grants you more picks to assign to other areas. The game has vast improvements to the user interface over its predecessor. There's a lot more automation involved, and many common tasks have been streamlined. The panel on the right side of the screen shows off basic information for your entire civilization. Issuing orders to ships is now a matter of select and click. There's also a line drawn between the ship and its destination, as well as the ETA given right on the map. This saves the player many tedious clicks when finding information. The stars on the galaxy screen contain a number of planets, asteroid belts, and gas giants. The colony ship is used to colonize new planets. It can land on any planet, but the less favorable planets will have penalties associated with it, such as higher maintenance costs and lower production. There are three areas you can have your population work in, farming, industry, and research. Your colonies can build structures that can improve their productivity. For example, a research lab increases research generated by a colony by five, plus one for every scientist. These structures must be researched before they can be built. The build screen gives you a list of structures and ships you can build. You can only have one of each type of structure. You can queue seven items in the build list. If another planet in the star system can be colonized, you can build a colony base for a lesser cost than a colony ship. You have the ability to purchase structures and ships to make them available in the next turn. The auto build feature will force the colony to automatically build the infrastructure without any intervention from the player, a very useful feature mid to late game. Some planets don't allow any food to be produced from it. To prevent starvation, the use of freighters are used to transport food from one colony to another. As long as you build sufficient freighters, this process is completely transparent. Freighters can also be used to transport your population from one colony to another. Once again, technology plays an essential role in the gameplay. Instead of splitting up your research into different areas, you focus on one technology at a time. There are eight categories, but it's important to note that some technologies, such as weapons, are not bound to a single category. You can find various weapons in physics, chemistry, and power. Every technology is available to you, but most civilizations can only choose one technology in a field of research. Creative races can obtain all technologies in a single field of research, while uncreative races are given one at random. You can also obtain new technologies the same way as in the previous game, through espionage, ground invasions, random events, or using diplomacy to trade technologies with another race. Diplomacy is still the same. Form treaties, alliances, trade technology, and declare war. One of the victory paths involves being elected into the Supreme Council. An election will be held every few turns once most of the galaxy has been colonized. Two-thirds of the votes are required to win the election, with the number of votes allocated based on the population of each player. If the option was set at the start of the game, an Antaran fleet will occasionally attack one of your colonies. You will have a few turns to set up your defenses before the fleet arrives. If they do manage to break through your defenses, they will only bombard your colony once. As the game's name suggests, attacking the Antaran homeworld is also a path to victory. 
Building a dimensional portal allows your fleet to travel to Antares, where you will face extremely powerful Antaran warships. A successful invasion of the Antaran homeworld is an automatic victory. Random events are also another option at the start of the game. If enabled, various events can occur, such as a space flux that disables movement between star systems. Other events, such as an axis shift on a planet, can happen, where the planet's environment will become better or worse. Occasionally, a leader will offer to join you for a price. There are two different kinds of leaders, administrative leaders that improve production of a star system, and ship officers who grant combat bonuses during space combat. Leaders will gain experience over time, and the bonuses increase. However, they can be killed off through conventional warfare or assassinated by enemy spies. Speaking of spies, these are trained the same way as everything else. A colony's industrial production is put towards it. The races screen is where you can manage your spies, either by sending them to another race or placing them on the defensive to protect yourself from everyone else. Spies on the offensive can be ordered to steal technology or sabotage infrastructure. Once again, the struggle for power comes down to whoever has the strongest fleet. You can design ships that utilize the technology you have obtained throughout the game. You can choose between six different classes of ships, with the Titan and Doomstar requiring research before they can be built. Your ships automatically use the latest engines and armor, but you can customize the shields, weapons, and special systems. You can also customize the angle at which direct fire weapons, such as lasers and mass drivers, can attack another ship. A weapon with a forward angle will take up less space on the ship than a weapon that has a 360 degree arc of fire. Missiles and bombs always have a 360 degree arc of fire. Depending on your level of technology, you can also add additional options to improve the weapon's effectiveness, but they increase the amount of space the weapons utilize. You can only build five different ships at a time, but any obsolete ships you have can be refit with newer weapons at a lower cost than a new ship. Space combat is where the action happens. All the ships are arranged on a grid. The amount of space each ship takes up on the map depends on their size. If the combat takes place at a colony, the starbase and any planetary defenses will support the defending ships. Various tactics can be employed depending on your ship's capabilities. Immobilizing a ship gives you the opportunity to board the ship and take control of it. You can also take advantage of enemy ships equipped with front-angled weapons by attacking them from behind whenever possible. But for the most part, the outcome depends on the level of technology and the ships involved. You can also choose to not attack the planet. If the hostile race chose not to engage your forces, the planet is effectively blockaded for the turn. This means no freighters can reach the colony, and no structures can be purchased there. The population of blockaded planets will slowly starve if it cannot produce enough food. Ground combat is also an option if you want to take control of a colony. There is no interaction from the player, and the results solely depend on the level of technology and the ground forces residing on the planet. A successful invasion will grant you control of the colony with all the structures intact. The population is enslaved, and you also have a chance of gaining enemy technology. A captured colony will have the resident population enslaved and will have reduced productivity. The colonists might rebel if there's not enough ground forces stationed there. Otherwise, the population will slowly be assimilated into your empire and productivity will return to normal. The benefit of having population from another race working for your empire are their genetic bonuses. An assimilated race that provides a bonus to farming, industry, or research will still apply. The graphics and presentation of the game are excellent even by today's standards. 
It takes advantage of a 640 by 480 resolution to provide all the game information in a clear and well-organized manner. You can view the terrain and structures of each planet when managing them, as well as in the ground combat screen. Everything, from the rotation of the planets on the galaxy screen to the breakthrough in research, are all visually appealing. The audio also scores top marks. Both the sound and music add to the tension during space and ground combat. Outside of combat, they're easy on the ears and can help relax the player. The soundtracks in the game can easily be considered some of the best music for PC games in the 90s. It should be mentioned that although the latest official version is 1.31, someone created a mod that fixes many of the bugs in the game. It can be considered an unofficial patch that updates the game to version 1.40. It also includes extra options that focus on gameplay balance. The ease of play, the controls, what you see and hear all come together perfectly. While many fans of the Master of Orion series claim that the first game is the best out of the three games, I would recommend playing the second game over the first simply because of the superior user interface, the gameplay depth, and the overall look and sound of it. I believe newer players, and especially the newer generation of gamers, will be able to easily learn how to play this game and enjoy it.